if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. And there's also no doubt in my mind that the whole world hangs in the balance. Hi there, I'm Lori Walmark, and today I'm going to talk to you about three scientific women of World War II, Grace Hopper, Hedy Lamarr, and Elizabeth Friedman. So let's start with Grace. Grace was born Grace Murray in 1906 in New York City. And there are three myths that have sort of come around and surrounded Grace Hopper. One of them is that she invented the term bug. The next is that she created the computer language COBOL. And the third is that she was the first woman admiral in the Navy. So as we go along, you'll hear that none of these are true. But I'm going to start in her childhood. And I'm going to start with a poem that she wrote in third grade, because this so much tells us about Grace and her personality. So here's her third grade poem. Faithfulness in all things, my motto is you see, the world would be a better place if all agree with me. And you'll see as we go along, she kept that motto into her adulthood. Grace loved math and science. Those were her favorite things. And she was fascinated with machines. She even built a dollhouse that had a working elevator in it. So her dolls could get, I guess, from the first to the second floor. She took apart alarm clocks to find out how they were, seven of them. I can just imagine what her parents thought about that. She was brilliant. She skipped three grades in school. Brilliant. Time to go to college. She's going to take the college entrance exams. And of course, there's not going to be a problem because she's so smart. Well, there was a little bit of a problem. Latin. She loved math and science. Latin, not so much. She failed the Latin exam. So she couldn't go to college with all her friends. She had to wait a year. When she went, she went to Vassar College, which at the time was an all women's college. And not surprisingly, she studied math and physics. And also not surprisingly, she became Phi Beta Kappa because she was brilliant. She tutored other students. And when she graduated, she went to Yale to get a PhD in mathematics. So this is all background of Grace. Here we come up to World War II. Grace's family and Grace herself were very patriotic. Her great-grandfather was an admiral in the Navy and Grace knew that they needed mathematicians in order to fight the war. They needed mathematicians to compute trajectories of missiles. Grace was a mathematician. Off she goes to sign up and they say, uh-uh-uh, we're not taking you. You're too old and you're too skinny. Well, remember that Grace is a child who thought everything would be great if everyone agreed with her? It took her a year, but eventually the Navy did accept her into the Naval Reserve. She went to do basic training like everyone else does in the Navy. And when she came out, they assigned her to the Bureau of Ships Computation Pro Project at Harvard University. This is where they would be using computers to compute these trajectories. She worked on one of the very first electronic computer, excuse me, the very first electronic computers, the Mark I. The problem was no one knew how to do it. No one knew how to program it, who was there. She had to figure it out all by herself. She ended up writing a manual, a 561 page manual, so other people could learn how to program this computer. She was in charge of all the programmers. And here's where we come to that first myth about bug. One day, her program wasn't working. She couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. She went over to the computer room. And back then, the computer room truly was you know, a room. It was a huge room trying to figure out what's going on. Eventually, she and her team figured it out. There was a moth trapped in a relay so it couldn't close, you know, that little moth. 
So they used Grace's eyebrow tweezers, took out the moth, she taped it into her logbook and said, first actual case of a computer bug being found. So she used computer bug for the first time. Bug had been used way back since Thomas Edison. So we've gotten rid of that first myth about Grace Hopper. After the war ended, she still wanted to continue to consult to the Navy and she turned down a full down professor. She turned down a professorship at Vassar to work for the Navy and also work for another computer company. This was the Eckley Bockley. Eck I'll try that one again. She went to work for another computer company, the Ecker Mockley Computer Corporation. And the computer she worked on there was called Univac One, also one of the first electronic computers, but this time it was multi-purpose. It didn't just compute tra trajectories, it could do many different things. While she was there, she developed a computer language called Flowmatic. Before that, in order to program computers, you were saying whether a switch was on or off, one or zero. So programs consisted of pages and pages and pages of ones and zeros, zeros and ones. It was so hard to program, but she developed this computer language that used words like multiply and divide. And that made it a lot easier for people to program. So now you didn't have to be a mathematician or an engineer. Now you could be, like today, a kid and program. This was great. Along came COBOL, the people developing COBOL. They did base it on Flowmatic and she was on the committee consulting to the COBOL people, but no, she did not develop the COBOL language. That was not hers. Continued to consult for the Navy and she rose and rose and rose and rose in the ranks of the Navy. Life was good until she turned 60. So the same Navy that had said, no, nope, you're too old to enter the Navy, now said, at 60, you're too old to stay in the Navy. They made her retire. She wasn't happy about this, but what could you do? A few months later, the Navy came back and said, um, you know, we made a little bit of a mistake. We could use your help just for this one little project. It'll take about six months. Will you come back and help her, help us? And she of course said, yes. Well, that little six month project lasted for about 20 years, and she retired from the Navy at age 80 as an admiral. Yes, she was one of the first woman admirals, but not the first one. And if you happen to know any young people who are interested in Grace's story, I've written a picture book biography, Grace Hopper, Queen of Computer Code, and they can learn all about Grace. So let's go on to our next person. And that's Hedy Lamar. She was born Hedwig Eva Kiesler in 1914 in Vienna, Austria. And the myth about Hedy is she was a spy. You know, somehow she was a spy against the Nazis. Again, the myth is not true as you'll find out as we go along. Like Grace, she was a curious child, wanted to know how things worked. She'd take a walk with her father and ask him, how does the streetcar work? Very curious. But unlike Grace, math and science, not so much. She didn't really care about them. What she wanted to do was act. And indeed, she became an actor. She had minor roles in plays, some minor roles in movies, and then one major role that followed her for the rest of her life. And this was in a movie called Ecstasy and it had a nude scene. And for the rest of her life, people always remembered that she had done this movie with a nude scene. But while she was acting in plays, a suitor came along, Fritz Mondel. 
and he'd come backstage, give her flowers, courted her, and they eventually married. Fritz was an arms merchant. He sold arms to whomever wanted them because that's how you make money as an arms merchant. He'd have dinner parties where there would be people like Nazis at the dinner party and they'd be talking about the arms. And Hetty, who was basically forced to stay in the house, she, was, she had had to quit acting. Fritz would not let her leave the house. So she was there when they were talking about munitions and arms. She wasn't spying. It was her house, her dinner party. One of the things they talked about that was a real problem was radio-controlled torpedoes. And the way radio-controlled torpedoes worked is on the ship, you had a transmitter, and that was set to a certain frequency, just like your radio can be set to a certain frequency. And you had a torpedo set to the same frequency. So the transmitter would tell the tor torpedo, go straight or turn or do whatever. The problem was if the enemy figured out that frequency, and they had a while to figure out the frequency while the torpedo was moving along, if the enemy figured out that frequency, they could send their own commands. So instead of being hit themselves, they could turn that torpedo right around and aim it right back at the sending ship. So this was clearly a problem. No one had a solution to it. They just had to live with it and hope that the enemy never figured out the frequency. Like I said, Hetty was not spying. It was in her own house at the dinner table that she was hearing these talks. Eventually, she left this abusive marriage. You know, good for her. And Louis B. Mayer of MGM fame discovered her and she emigrated to the United States. She spent six months learning English. And old Louis did not think that Hedwig Eva Kiesler was a good name for a great actor. He changed it to the name we know now, which is Hetty Lamar. The other thing he did, which was very smart on his part, is he dubbed her the most beautiful woman in the world. Was she? There are a lot of beautiful women out there. She certainly was beautiful. But because he had said she's the most beautiful woman, now she was. She acted in several movies. This was great. Her fame grew. But Hetty really wanted to be more than a pretty face. That curiosity she had as a child stayed through as an adult. She set up a lab in her house. So after long hours on the set making movies, she'd come home and tinker and make inventions. She never patented any of these, but some of these inventions we now use. For example, she thought there should be some way to let people know that the red light is about to happen. Well, we have that in our traffic lights with the yellow light. Or there should be some way to see dogs at night with a lit up collar. Well, we certainly have dog collars that are reflective now. So this curious child became a curious adult, but in the back of her mind, she wanted to do more. Along comes, again, World War II. Hetty was Jewish, though she didn't advertise the fact. She had Jewish relatives back in Europe. She was very concerned about them. She was also very patriotic for her new country. She wanted to do anything she could do to help with the war effort. What could an actress do? She could raise war bonds. And wow, did she. She raised $25 million worth of war bonds. The other thing she did is she, oops, sorry about that. Thought I had turned off the phone. The other thing she did is she volunteered at the Hollywood Canteen. She danced and talked with GIs who were about to go off to war, you know, making their life a little bit easier. She even washed dishes. This famous, glamorous Hollywood actress was washing dishes. 
but she wanted to do more. And she remembered that talk back at the dinner table with the arms merchants, with the Nazis, with the problem with torpedoes. And she thought, there's got to be a way to solve this problem. She hooked up with another person, George Antile, who happened to be a noted com composer. So neither of them were scientists, especially, or had any knowledge in this area. But they got together, and Hetty came up with an idea. She called it the hopping of frequencies. So you remember that torpedo? You, know, you have the sending, and it's at a frequency. She said, what if the frequencies keep changing all the way along as it's between the torpedo and the ship so that if an enemy happens to pick up the right frequency, by the time they can do anything, the radio is on to another frequency. This was an amazing idea. No one had thought of it. It seems commonplace now, but back then, it seems so simple, like so many inventions are, but you can't patent an idea. She and George got together to figure out a way to implement this idea, something you could put in the torpedo and put on the ship so that the, they could know what the frequencies were at the same time. They figured it out, they patented their invention, but being patriotic, they gave it to the Navy. They said, we want you to have this to help the war effort. We don't want anything from it. This was great. The Navy classified it top secret, which certainly is not a surprise because you certainly don't want the enemy to get this technology. But the other thing the Navy did, which was unfortunate, is they decided that it would take too much time and too much money while we're in the middle of a war to implement this. So they put it on a shelf and didn't use it. And to think lives could have been saved if it had been implemented, but it wasn't, it was put away on a shelf. It was eventually declassified in 1981. But by then their patent had long expired. So commercial companies realized what a great idea this was. And they all jumped in and they started using this technology. And frequency hopping is part of what keeps our devices safe, our Wi-Fi, our GPS, our phones. It helps keep people from getting into our messages as they go between the devices. And it's, because all, it's all because of this hopping of frequencies. For years, they never got any credit for it. The commercial companies were making money from their invention, but no one said, you know, thank you guys, nothing like that. In 1997, Hetty received the Pioneer Award from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And she had one comment after receiving this award. She said, it's about time. And it was. If you have any children who are interested in Hetty's life, I have a book, Hetty Lamar's Double Life, and they can learn more about her. Let's go to our final person, Elizabeth Smith Friedman, born Elizabeth Smith in 1892 in Huntington, Indiana. Elizabeth Friedman's archives are right here in the Marshall Foundation. Actually not right here because I'm in my office, but if I were in the Marshall Foundation, the archives would be right there, which is why it's so exciting to me to talk about her. There are no myths that I know of about her because no one knew about her. Her story was hidden for so long that there was not time for anyone to come up with any myths about her. Her early life, the one thing she had in common with the other two is, again, very intelligent, very smart. 
but she had no interest in math and science like Grace did. She loved books. She loved literature. She loved reading. When it came time for her to go to college, her father said, I'm not going to pay. And she said, that's okay. I'll work, I'll earn the money and I'll go myself. She had that determination that the other two women had, which is so strong. That's the thread that runs through all these three stories is that determination to do something. Her father ended up loaning her money for college and she majored in English literature and she studied Greek and she studied poetry, she studied philosophy, graduates from college. Obviously you need a job. She became a substitute teacher for a year, a substitute principal and teacher. That job ended. She's back home again, needs another job. She decides, I'm going to go to the big city. I'm gonna to go to Chicago. There in Chicago, surely I can find a job in literature or research. Off she went to Chicago, for two weeks, she was looking for a job, nothing, no luck. She had to go back home again. But before she went home, she said to herself, I'm going to go to the Newberry Library because in the Newberry Library, there is a Shakespeare first folio. And she loved Shakespeare. The idea of seeing a folio of Shakespeare's from his time, she wasn't going to let that pass her by, even though she didn't find, have a job and she was going to have to go home without one. She went to the library and in talking to the librarian, she mentioned she was looking for a job. And the librarian said, funny you should say that. There's a businessman, George Fabian, and he's looking for a researcher. Fabian had a complex on his land. He had labs for scientists. It was a whole big complex called Riverdale in Geneva, Illinois. And he hired her to help prove that Shakespeare did not write his plays, that Francis Bacon wrote the plays. And how was she going to prove that? Because Fabian was convinced there were hidden codes inside those plays. And you could tell the codes because of the way the letters were. Maybe a letter E was a little bit like this or a little bit like that or a little lighter or a little darker. And those, were, those would be the codes that Francis Bacon put into the plays to let people know that he had written them and Shakespeare hadn't. Elizabeth took the job, spent a lot of time looking at it printed material and realized there were no hidden codes. This material had been typeset by hand. Of course, there are going to be little variations along the way because someone had put the E into the form and then another E, and it might be a little bit this way and a little bit that way, but there were no codes. But doing this gave her an interest in puzzles and codes, which was great. She met her husband, there, her future husband there, William, who was a geneticist, and he too became interested in codes. They'd send each other little love notes and codes that you had to decode before you could read the love note. So it was very sweet. Along comes World War I. We're not even up to World War II yet. We're at World War I. And Fabian, set up the Riverbank Department of Ciphers. He put William and Elizabeth in charge of it. No one knew about code breaking back then. It was hit or miss. So they were in charge of it because they were interested in codes. The Riverbank Department of Ciphers became the main location for military code breaking in America in World War I. In its first eight months, it, was the, it did all of the US government code breaking. You have Elizabeth and William in charge. You have people working for them. No one knew what they were doing. They were just doing the best they could. They developed new scientific techniques for code breaking. And many consider this to be the beginning 
of scientific code breaking right here. And Elizabeth was in at the ground floor. They published eight pamphlets that people still use. Of course, Elizabeth's name was not on any of the pamphlets because she was a woman. But on one of the pamphlets in ink, someone wrote by Elizabeth and William. And William told other people that Elizabeth worked on the pamphlets, of course. Eventually, they left Riverbank and joined the Army Signal Corps. This was the group in the Army who was doing code breaking. Because it's World War I, William eventually gets sent off to France, and Elizabeth keeps code breaking. And their group that Elizabeth was in created the first scientifically scientifically constructed pen and pencil. Their group created the first scientifically constructed pen and paper codes and ciphers. Again, right there at the beginning of the science of cryptography. After the war, when William eventually came home, they went their separate ways and he worked somewhere else, but they, he, he was still doing code breaking also. In 1922, she decided, I'm going to stay home for a bit. I'm going to write. She stayed home with two pets, and you've got to love these names. It was Crypto the dog and Pinkle Purr the cat. So she and Crypto and Pinkle Purr wrote a book about code breaking, because that's what she knew for teens and adults. She also wrote an illustrated alphabet book for children that she herself illustrated. Neither of these were published. But while she was home, people kept coming to her door wanting her to do code breaking. She eventually gave in and went to work for the Navy for about five months doing code breaking, got pregnant, went back home again, had two children, but you know, knock, knock, knock on the door. They kept coming. Now we're past the war. And this time it's the Coast Guard who came. And at the time the Coast Guard was part of the Treasury Department. What did the Coast Guard want? They needed some help tracking down rum runners who would send their messages in code and no one could decode them. Elizabeth went to work for the Coast Guard, and in her first three months, she decoded two years of backlogged messages from rum runners. And these codes were actually tougher than the military code she had decoded before, because let's face it, the rum runners cared about money. If someone decoded their stuff, they lost money. She worked on a lot of different cases, and she was the only senior cryptanalyst in the Treasury Department. She made copies of every code she decoded and put them in bound books, right? She put them in bound books. In six years, she had 30 bound books of messages because she was doing so much decoding. It was amazing. She created the first code breaking unit in treasury history. Now she's trying to hire people, but there are no code breakers really. It wasn't a profession. You couldn't go out and put an ad and say, I'm looking for a code breaker. That wouldn't work. So she looked for mathematicians and physicists and chemists because she knew that they would have the analytical mind and thinking to do code breaking. She ended up with three junior code breakers, a couple of stenographers. Things were going well. They're breaking a lot of codes. Prohibition ends. You would think that her job would end, but no. Now they're breaking codes for drug smugglers. It keeps moving on and on, she keeps working. And in 1941, she's now breaking codes of Nazis. Nazis in Brazil and, and Argentina who are sending messages to Germany. She's breaking those codes. Then they find out that someone is sending messages from Long Island, New York. There were Nazi spies right here on the US soil. Those messages needed to be decoded. 
and Elizabeth and her team did it, 33 spies were convicted of espionage because of Elizabeth's work. But the FBI, who had nothing, nothing at all to do with the code breaking, claimed the credit. Elizabeth and her team were never mentioned. Now we're finally really into the US, into World War II. We finally make it to World War II. She had a long career. And in World War II, you may have heard of a machine, a German machine called Enigma. This was a code-making machine that was supposedly unbreakable. You may have also heard that Alan Turing and his group out at Bletchley Park broke the Enigma code. That's great. But what you probably have never heard is that Elizabeth and her team also broke the Enigma code. Because of wartime secrecy, the two groups didn't work with each other. They didn't know that the other had done the work. Again, think of if they could have worked together, how much faster they could have broken these codes and maybe the war would have been shorter. The way Enigma works is this. A cipher is just a simple code. You could say in the plain text, an A becomes a B, a B becomes a C, a C becomes a D and so forth. If you have an A later on in the text, it becomes a B again. It's very straightforward, very simple. What Enigma did is for each letter in the message, it would change to a different alphabet. So if you had an A at the beginning, it might become a B, but an A later on might become a Q and another A might become an R. It was incredibly difficult to figure these out. How do, how do you break this kind of code? Well, you break it because someone makes a mistake, which is how often these things are done. When you set the first code for Enigma, then each succeeding one for all the different letters in the message are the same. If you never change that first one, then the second one is the same as it was before. The third one is the same as it was before. The fourth one, so that A still might code to something else, but now you have a whole host of messages and you can look at the very first letter of the code, of the plain, I'm sorry, of the coded message and start figuring it out that way. And that's what they did. They figured it out. Again, an amazing achievement. The government classified her work as top secret ultra, which is not surprising. You certainly don't want the enemy to know that you figured out their code. She's still in the Coast Guard, but now the Coast Guard has moved from Treasury to the Navy. We're way into the depth of World War II now. Pearl Harbor happens. And after Pearl Harbor, the Navy said, we can't have a civilian in charge of cryptography. We, we need someone in the Navy. It can't be a civilian. So the fact that she had worked all these years, she was the head, the chief cryptanalyst in treasury meant nothing. Now she had a boss in, on top of her. And so all the cryptograph, all the decodes that you see after that have his name and not her name, even though she and her team were still doing all the work. Every once in a while, you could see a little ESF, her initials in a corner. Kept working for the Coast Guard, but even working there, other agencies come a knocking. And in this case, it was the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, the people who later became the CIA. And they said, we need you to set up a cryptographic section for us. So she did. She hired people. She figured out the um, methods. She set up the first cryptographic service uh, section in the CIA. I find it amazing 
how one person can, yes, she has scientific methods, but that she also somehow sees these patterns is just amazing. And I'll give you an example. Ciphers are when you change one letter for another, but you also have codes and you can have an open code where you write a letter that people can read. It doesn't look like gobbledygook and random letters and stuff. People can read it, but it's sending a message to the receiver somehow. And this was the case with Velvely Dickinson. She was known as the doll lady and also World War II's number one woman spy. She sold dolls. So she was sending letters to people about dolls supposedly, but Elizabeth and her team figured out that when Velvely wrote fisherman with a net over his, net, over his back, that meant a mind sweeper. And if she wrote old woman with wood on her back, that was a warship with a superstructure. Maybe she was supposedly selling a doll of a little boy that meant a small war warship. Belvely was caught, charged with espionage. Somehow, like I said, it, it is beyond my understanding how, the, how she could have figured this out, but she and her group did. But once again, the FBI took all the credit because they did. In fact, the, the FBI director took credit for all her major achievements. He shaped the narrative. He wrote a seven page story in the American magazine called How the Nazi Spy Invasion Was Smashed. It never mentioned Elizabeth or her team and the code breaking they did. It's like somehow magically the FBI was able to know where the spies were. No, they knew because of the work Elizabeth did. After she retired and after her husband died, she collected all his papers, his personal professional papers, and she cataloged them and she sent them again here to the Marshall Foundation. She also sent her own papers, though so she didn't really do the work of cataloging it. The librarians here had to do all that work. And if you have someone, a young person who's interested in her life, I have a book that I wrote, Code Breaker Spy Hunter, How Elizabeth Friedman Changed the Course of Two World Wars. And if you look at all these little ribbons around here, those are all codes. And in the back of the book, it explains how kids can be a code breaker and then they can break the codes of the pictures. So we have three women from World War II, three scientific women. We have Grace, who programmed trajectories, trained other programmers, led programming teams, clearly a major effort in, you know, towards the war, towards ending the war. We have Hetty, who co-invented a device to prevent radio guidance signals from being intercepted, but it was never used. She did help the war effort in other ways, obviously, but not scientifically, unfortunately. And then we have Elizabeth who decoded thousands and thousands of coded messages, trained other cryptanalysts and created and led teams. Three amazing women that many women, that many people have never heard of. I'm gonna end up by mentioning, if you have any questions about these three women, about my books, about me. I'm very easy to contact. I am lucky enough to have a short name and an unusual name. So my website is www.lauriewalmart.com, or I guess I should say www.lauriewalmart.com. On Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, you look for Lori Walmart you'll find me. I happen to be very lucky, very easy to get a hold of. I'm more than happy to talk with people about these three women because clearly I care a lot about them. Otherwise I would not have written books about them.
And finally, I have some thanks. First, of course, to the Marshall Foundation for having these legacy lecture series. Then to Melissa Davis, librarian extraordinaire, who helped me with the research for my book on Elizabeth Friedman. And to Glenn Carpenter, who's the man behind the curtain. Finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for taking the time to listen and to boost the signal about three scientific women from World War II whose achievements are rarely acknowledged. Thank you. <laughs>